take a trip back to the 411 table and grab one of these because these are your notes. You can find out what's happening for the next couple weeks. Okay, so December 4th, let's start this off. Uh, we got a lot going on December 4th. Baby dedication. If you know a baby that wants to be dedicated, I know we got a couple signed up already. Sign-ups are in the back. Same day after baby dedication, chili cook-off. I'm really excited about that. Uncle Mark's excited. There's a lot of people. Kathy's ready to go. She's got a recipe cooking. So I got, I got to, I got to spruce up mine to make sure I beat you. Uh, December 6th, we have the woman's wreath making class that sounds like a blast to me right it's gonna be fun um stephanie's leading that she's an incredible florist so make sure to sign up for that it's gonna be a blast and then today was sign up for serve day so in my um study the last couple weeks it's been all about serving serving god serving the church so i wanted to read some of this incredible content that was in my um devotions five reasons to serve god ready serving is one of your life purposes mark 8 35 says only those who throw away their lives for my sake and the sake of good news will ever know what it means to really live isn't that good it gives me chills i'm like what can i do more for god for church to serve others that's all i'm thinking about okay next serving makes you more like jesus Matthew 20, 28 says, even the, san, the son of man can come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So good. The next is serving is the highest use of your time. So good. There are so many of us that were here at 8, 8.30 a.m. working hard to get these seats up, to get the bleachers going, to get the sound going. It takes a village, but it's, it's, it's the most rewarding you know what? It's not easy to get up at 7 a.m. on Sunday, right? <laughs> it's not. You know, I'm hitting the alarm like, no. Then I remember, I'm doing it for the Lord. Let's go, right? Okay, last one. Nope, I got two more. Serving is the secret to greatness. It's so true. Serving will be rewarded in heaven. Jesus said in Mark 10:29 through 30, I can guarantee this truth. Anyone who gave up anything because of me and the good news will certainly receive a hundred times as much. Ultimately, your real boss is Jesus, and he will reward you one day for everything you've done for him. That's a guarantee. It's good. It's good stuff. So, so please sign up. There's so many ways to serve at the Rich Church where you feel, I don't know if I'm very fit. We'll find something for you. I promise. Promise. All right. Did I miss something? Yes, I did. December 24th, our Christmas Eve service right here, 5 p.m. That's a Saturday, right? I think so, right? Yeah, so then we're not doing Sunday service, just a Christmas Eve service, right? Aunt Lori? Pastor Lori? Pastor Lori? Not Aunt Lori? All right, that's all I got. Can we give a nice warm welcome to Pastor Mark Welch? <laughs> Thank you, Drea. You're Hey, I don't even know what to do. I've got both hands free because I got this cool new microphone that's over my ear here. I feel so weird because I'm used to just using one hand. Good to see you guys. It's, good. it's a great day. Really great day. Happy Thanksgiving. Who's ready? Who's excited? Who? Okay, I have a, I have a couple questions for you. All right. Do you raise your hand if... At your home, you have a Sam's Club or Costco pumpkin pie usually at Thanksgiving. Raise your hand. I see hands. How about homemade pumpkin pie? Anybody? Be over at your house. We'll look forward to seeing you. That'll be just great. Now, we're going to have a great, great time uh, in our family. Now, um, the Mills girls do not like turkey. You know, it's un-American. I don't, I don't understand it, but they love all this other stuff at Thanksgiving. Yesterday, uh, Lori and I were down in SoCal for two days to see our grandson play football on Friday night. That was a lot of fun. And then we just drove up fast last night and got back home. But uh, I said to Alexa, I said, you guys enjoy your uh, fancy schmancy, you know, Thanksgiving. I'm going to go home and have a good old-fashioned turkey dinner is what I'm going to do this year. But it's fun. No matter what you do, no matter how you celebrate it, make sure you're giving thanks. 
And that's what Sunday, this Sunday is about. And I want to talk to you about something that we can call thanks thinking. Very hard to say it. See if you can say it with me. Okay, can you say that? Ready? Thanks thinking. Thanksgiving starts with the way you think. It starts in your heart and mind. And Jesus said, whatever's in your heart will come out through your mouth. Okay? And so if you find yourself complaining, speaking negative language, all those things means you're, something's wrong in here. That's what Jesus says. And so today, we're going to take a look at five ways that you can practice thanks thinking. Again, it's a little, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but um, I want you to learn how to apply this not only at Thanksgiving time, but as a part of your daily life. I think this is going to make a difference. Now, evidently, I spit out of this side of my mouth because nobody was willing to see, sit in these seats. So these are. So I'll probably preach to these. If I get uncomfortable, I'll just preach right here. But it is so good to be with you guys. And today, let's get right into this and see what the Lord teaches us. Uh, are, do we have the scriptures all right up on the screen, Andrea? Okay, w- today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to read this entire passage together. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8 in the New Living Translation. And so we're going to read it together. And when you read it, We're not going to read it really fast because I want it to sink in a little bit before we get into the teaching today. But read it with me. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Ready? Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit your word to our hearts. We pray that it will change our hearts and that we will become people of thanksgiving this Thanksgiving time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, five ways for you to practice thanksgiving. How to think with thanks. All right? Who wrote this passage? This was written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was laying on a beach somewhere, and he was enjoying virgin Mai Tais and just eating, you know, rich food when he wrote this. No, he wasn't. The Apostle Paul penned Philippians from a dungeon in Nero's prison in Rome. Now listen, guys, I don't know I don't know if he was in one of these dungeons. We don't know exactly the setting. He did seem to have a few privileges that other prisoners didn't. But we know that he was in chains. And when you were in chains in a dungeon in a Roman prison, there was no co- creature comforts whatsoever. He didn't even get to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. There was nothing to give this guy a sense of pleasure and joy. They have uncovered some of the dungeons in Rome that the prisoners were kept in that were literally in the, in the uh, human body waste sewers of Rome. And a couple times a day, they would open the sluices and human waste would flow through these sewers up to the necks of the prisoners. You better hope you weren't too short. But the Apostle Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit today. Because how do you translate? How do you translate what he's writing here 
into what he's experiencing here. Brian, think about it. How would you be thinking naturally if you were in that setting, right? Connor, you've been through a lot with your football practices, but I'll bet you wouldn't trade him during your worst football practice with all the pain with what he was going through, right? And as I think about my life and the stuff I've been through and the way I normally think when things aren't really great, how do you get to a place where you can translate this kind of teaching into that kind of an experience? I don't know what you're going through this Thanksgiving, but probably all of you have some challenges in life. Uh, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's one of those times right now in your life when all is well. You're at peace. Everything is perfect for a couple minutes, right? Because what we all know is that every one of us are going to go through our challenges in life. Something is going to happen, and maybe it's happened to you in the past. But I can tell you right now, if you're in a great time, a time when there are no perils, no problems at all, enjoy that because around the corner, something else will happen. Jesus promised us not a life of easy, you know, lazy boy life, but a life that would have problems. But he wants us to learn how to overcome those problems spiritually. So let's get into this. Here's the first thing that you will need if you're going to have thanks thinking. You need to learn contentment. Learn contentment. Contentment is interesting because contentment doesn't mean that everything is perfect. It means that you are at peace in your heart no matter what the circumstances The circumstances are not the main thing that drive your life. Anybody can seek happiness. And you know, a lot of times happiness has to do with good circumstances. Would would you agree that we, we normally as Americans think in terms of pursuing happiness? We want to have a life that's got less problems than more problems. Obviously, we all want that. But Paul says that you can learn how to be content even when the circumstances are not good in your life. In verses 4 through 5, he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. And then he says it, the way he says it again is, I say it again, rejoice. And you know what? He's writing it for us. But I wouldn't doubt as he's strapped to this wall with chains, freezing cold temperatures or hot temperatures or whatever he's going through, Friends having to be relied upon to even bring him a crust of bread. And as he's strapped there, waiting his death under the emperor Nero, I wouldn't doubt that Paul is repeating this for his own good. Can you imagine? He says, Paul, I'm saying it again right right now. Always be full of joy. I will say it again. Rejoice. And he's saying to us in the worst of our circumstances, Be joyful. Be full of joy. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. And I don't think he's saying, the Lord is coming soon and he's going to get you if you're not joyful. I think he's saying, don't forget, this life is short. But what's coming in eternity, the the reward that we're going to have in heaven when we awaken one day in glory, is going to be so great that you can live through whatever problem you have here. Keep your focus and learn contentment because God's not done with you. Over in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, Paul is talking about his own experience. He says this, Now that I speak in regard to need, not that I, I'm sorry, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, this is what Paul says right after this, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. So what what is Paul saying? He's saying my joyfulness 
is fixed on something permanent, unchanging, and undeniable. Joy in my life is different than happiness. We as Americans, we think they're the same thing. But happiness can be circumstantial. I hope you have a happy Christmas, right? But even more important, have a joyful Christmas because joy is a choice you make in all circumstances to be joyful. So what are your rough circumstances? Anybody want to trade with Paul? And yet Paul says, I've learned how to be content, whether I'm hungry or full, have much or nothing. I have learned that joy is possible when I focus on Jesus, his reward for me, and the way he is with me. Here's the second thing you need to do. And I'm going to ask you to say this with me. Worry about nothing. Can you say that with me? Worry about nothing. Come on, guys. Worry about a few things. Worry about some things. No. Worry about nothing. Now, when Paul says the word nothing here, in the Greek, that word means nothing. Nada. It means don't let worry rule your life. How many of you feel like you have the spiritual gift of worry? You know, there's the gift of helps, the gift of preaching, the gift of teaching, the gift of worry, right? Do you have the gift of worry? Paul says, take control of it. It's your choice. Because as you're learning contentment, you also cannot have contentment if you worry. You've got to follow these steps if you really want that joy. He says, don't worry about anything. Jesus told us we were going to have those problems in life. But I want to tell you, that you will either have a life reflecting worry or faith. Worry or faith. If you worry, there's no room for faith to show itself. If you have faith, worry has to be driven away. You either have to say, God, I trust you right now in all of my circumstances. And no matter what the world says is coming my way, my trust, God, is in you. I trust God no matter what. That's what brings peace in our lives. Because worry and faith cannot coexist. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus speaking, he says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Stay in this moment today. Let whatever possible problems. And see, the problem is when we focus on something, it gets smaller or bigger. Bigger. Whatever you put your focus on gets bigger, not smaller, because You start thinking about it. It rules your thoughts. You go to bed at night. You're tossing and turning because of the problem you may have tomorrow. 95% of those problems don't ever even happen. And yet we get our lives into this wreck of worry. We, We get consumed by it. Worry about nothing. But listen, it's not possible to do that without the third step. You've got to do something instead of worry. What is that? Paul teaches it to us right now. Number three, pray about... The Greek word for everything there means... Say it. Yeah. I got to tell you, my mother-in-law, Jerry, she's here, by the way. She couldn't be here last week, but she's here today with her little fancy schmancy cane... I mean, Jerry can't do anything in just a normal way. Give me just a cheap cane. She's got to have the bling on it. She's got all the rhinestones and all that. Unbelievable, but she is so cool. But I don't know anybody who's taught us the lesson more about praying about everything than my mother-in-law, Jerry. She, if you read her book, Oy Vey, Such a Deal, that book, if you haven't read it, you should ask her how you can get it and read it. 
But Jerry prays about the littlest things. And a lot of times, Lori and I will go over there and say, you know, Mom, we, we, we've got this situation. You know, the bank called, and they've got this going on. We're just kind of telling her. All of a sudden, we're looking over at her, and she's, she's already praying. Lord, we just pray right now that Wells Fargo will get their act together. And... <laughs> And that they will give Mark and Lori what they need. And uh, she pre- prays. She prays about not just a few things. Jerry prays about everything. You know why? Because she, like you and me, has a tendency, if we don't pray, to do what? That's right. You get a choice. You either get to worry or you get to pray. Pray about everything. That's what Paul says in this passage. Don't worry about anything. Instead, instead, pray about everything. The word instead in the Greek means instead. I'm so glad you guys know that I'm a Greek scholar now. Instead of worrying, choose, choose prayer. Prayer is something that you must choose. Do you know, in the First World War, the Trench War, bombs were coming in. Uh, these, you know, these Allied soldiers were in fear of their lives. The German bombs were, the, the mortars were coming in on, on these trenches. And, and finally, uh, the captain said, boys, it's getting really bad. We better pray. And one of the soldiers said, has it come to that? It's backwards. God wants us to pray first. There was a little song in a musical our kids were in when they were little. It was called the musical. I mentioned it a few months ago. It's called Fat, Fat Jehoshaphat. It was a really cute little kids Christian musical. And it was about Jehoshaphat and how he called his nation to prayer. First thing, fasting and prayer when the enemy, a great enemy was coming. And this little song that the kids sang when they were just this tall. I mean, little Nate, they were all, Nate was in the army in this thing, and he was dressed in camo. And, but watching our kids sing this song, the problem is, is that this is one of the songs that you can never get out of your head. But the good part is, is this is one of the songs you can never get out of your head. And here's how it goes. I'm not going to do it like they would. I'll do my best. First you pray, first you pray. The moment you see a problem come your way, most of the time it's last on your mind, but first you need to pray. And you know what? To this day, when I begin to worry, that song pops in my head. Sometimes we want to worry. Like it's a gift. I get to hang on to this. Worry is my right. Don't take it from me. Some people don't want worry taken from them. But really, they hang on to it like it's something precious. But first, you need to pray. And God, I believe, wants us to package our worries up in a big trash bag and dump them on Him. I truly believe that. Why? Because he knows exactly what to do with worry. Throw it away. Because he's in charge. He's watching over us. And he cares about us. In fact, I can prove it. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it's exactly... Let's take a look at this verse. Read it with me. Right out loud. Ready? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, that word cast means jettison. It means literally throw it at God. The next time worry comes, anxiety comes, what does the Bible say to do with it? Who, what do you do with it and to whom do you give it? You give it to the God who's in control in your life, the one that you follow, the one that you trust. He'll take care of you. That's what it means. God will take care of you. 
through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. It's an old hymn that we used to sing. Some of you recognized it. We're really old. You know, God knows everything going on in your life right now. You guys know that? He knows about your 401k turning into a 201k recently. It's an old joke, but he, he, he knew that. He saw that before it even happened. He knows about your house value dropping a little bit or the interest rates going up and it's really interesting because he says, worry about, pray about, because he doesn't live in this world of worry. God's not up there biting his fingernails right now over your situation. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. What are we supposed to pray about? Pray about everything. A.W. Tozer is a famous theologian from early last century, lived up until the mid part of last century. And uh, he was one of the early Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, theologians and pastors. Uh, Well known, his books are studied all over the world even today, but he says this about God and his ability to answer prayer. I think this is great. Here's what he says. Brethren, sounds very last century, doesn't it? Brethren, you have been born of God, and our Christian hope is a valid hope. It's a valid hope. No emptiness, no vanity, no dreams that cannot come true. What? Wow. Your expectation should rise and you should challenge God and begin to dream high dreams of faith and spiritual attainment and expect God to meet them. You cannot out-hope God and you cannot out-expect God. Remember that all your hopes are finite, but all of God's ability is infinite. So what is it that is bothering you. It's nothing that God cannot handle. It's nothing that God doesn't already know about. That's why we've got to choose to worry about nothing. First of all, choose joy, right? Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. But here's where it gets really juicy. I love this next one. This is good. Number four Thank God in all things. Say that right with me. Thank God in all things. By the way, Andrea, thank you for putting these notes together. They're helpful. Don't you guys think they're helpful? Thank you so much. Thank God in all things. Here's what it says in verse 6b of our passage. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Pray about it and then say, God... Even with what I'm going through right now, even in this dungeon or whatever the situation is, I want to be thankful. This is my time to have thanks thinking. This is my time to think thankful thoughts. Right now, with all you have going on, I want you to do something with me. I'm going to do it too. Uh, I'll do it quietly with my microphone on. But I'm going to do the same thing. I dare you to stop at five things you're thankful for. Just take a moment, close your eyes with me, if you would, on line two, and see if there aren't just a handful of things you can thank God for in your life right now. What are you thankful for? Just kind of speak that quietly 
right where you are, is a prayer to the Lord. Give him some thanks. Are you listing some things? How many of you are already passed by? Thank you. Bing Crosby says, I go to sleep counting my blessings. You know, it changes your thing, your life, when you count blessings, when you are thankful for things. It, it, it changes you because it's impossible to worry and complain when you're giving thanks. Giving thanks is ultimate in that ability to say, God, if you did it before, you can do it again. If I trusted you then and you helped me then and you came through then and you've given me this and this and this and this and this, I can continue to give you thanks in all circumstances. I can trust you. I can tell you all I'm thankful for. It doesn't say give him thanks for all circumstances. It says in all circumstances. Because let's be real, there are certain things... We just wish we could get rid of, right? Are there a few things that you just wish, man, it would be really nice if I didn't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about it. But it would be nice if it wasn't even in my life to cause the temptation of worry. It would be nice if this thing was different in my life. Are you thinking of something that you you wish wasn't in your life that you could get rid of? Do not look next to you at the person next to you. Do not do that today. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. A lot of people spend in their Christian life a lot of time trying to figure out God's will. I wonder what God's will is in my life. Start with this. It is God's will that you be thankful in all circumstances. In the Greek, well, you already know what it means. Be thankful in all circumstances. And then finally, you guys, just to finish up, maybe the biggest challenge is the battle for the mind. Because we may conquer, we may leave here today like under this conviction that, man, I can do this. I'm not going to worry about a single thing. I'm going to turn it all into prayer. I'm going to choose to be joyful. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be thankful for everything. And you're going to go out there and, God forbid, there's not a nail in your tire. Because all of a sudden, oh no, there's a nail in my tire. What am I going to do? I just bought that tire. I can't afford a new tire. What am I going to do? And you'll say, wow, that hurt. You see, Pastor Tim and I aren't aren't really all that different. That's something he would have done too. Only he would have punched himself in the nose probably. But the final step is to do this. Think about the right things. Think about the right things. Think about the what? That must mean that there are some wrong things. There are some wrong things to think about. Things that we may fill our mind with that aren't good for us. Do you think it's possible to choose to eat bad food? I'm so glad Domine is not here today. Domine, happy Thanksgiving, Domine. She makes good choices of food. I don't always. But food is for the body. What, what the things you choose to think about are for the mind. You see, you're feeding your mind things. You know that, that little sign that, that shows, um, it, it's like a street sewer sign, and it says no dumping flows to the creek or flows to the ocean or whatever. You see, we should have that kind of sign hung over our brains. It says no dumping flows to the heart. 
Because if you put bad stuff in here, it's going to end up in here, and it's going to come out here in an all manner of sinful things. Because you cannot fill your mind full of bad stuff and expect good results to come. John Maxwell, uh, a person we've worked with in the past and, and appreciate and know very well. He's a, he's a well-known leadership trainer in the world. And John says something interesting. He says, he says, everything worthwhile is uphill. But most of us want uphill results with downhill habits. See, we want a life full of hope and joy and freedom and no worry, praying about everything, but we keep filling our minds full of downhill stuff and i'm not going to tell you what those things are you have to determine that for yourself but what does paul say the antidote is to it in verse 8 of philippians 4 he says this and now dear brothers and sisters one final thing now first let's go over what he's he shared already choose joy you know you can you can choose to be grateful You can choose the right attitude. You'll never get to the right altitude without the right attitude. You can make choices no matter what the circumstances are to learn to be content. Number two, worry about nothing. It's a choice. Choose it. Now listen, we're so used to worrying that you're going to catch yourself over and over and over going there first. But just remind yourself of what my kid's saying. First you pray. First you pray. The second you see a problem come your way. Most of the time it's last on your mind, but first you need to pray. That's what God wants you to do because he says worry about nothing, but instead pray about everything. Give thanks in all things and then think about the right things. Here's what Paul says. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Listen, guys, maybe it's time to go for a walk. And look at the autumn leaves laying on the ground. And then let yourself go to a place of thanksgiving for the beauty that's around you. You see... Sometimes we're surrounded with the good gifts of God, but we just are so into the worry and the negative thinking, we can't even see what's around us that's good. But Paul says, put your focus on it. Maybe it's time to turn the news off. Lori and I had to make a choice to not watch the news at night. We get a little piece of it in the morning, And then turn it off. Why? Because when you go to bed, with that stuff playing, what do you think it does to worry and anxiety in your life? It's a choice. Right? I chose a while back. I've got a certain viewpoint of life. I chose to stop listening to talk radio. Because it was turning me into a worrier, into a negative person. And in these days, guys, this is a temptation, is it not? No matter what side you find yourself on, if you, if you just start feeding yourself all this stuff, God says, put it in a big bag and dump it on me. Because your attitude will follow your thought patterns. You cannot control your circumstances, but you can control your thoughts. And you have to make a choice. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The result? If you'll do these five things, if you do this, verse 7, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. Look at this. His peace will keep your thoughts and your heart quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ. I pray that you will have a thanksgiving thanksgiving. I pray that you will have a quiet, peaceful Thanksgiving, even with Aunt Tess and all of her negative attitude coming to the house. 
And I don't have an Aunt Tess, and that's why I use that name. But the holidays are coming, guys. And are there not going to be people that grind you a little bit? Hmm? I must be thinking about my family. Your family's perfect. No, we're blessed. We're blessed because we've got Christ. He's our everything. He's what matters to us. Let's practice these five things. Can you guys remember these things? And hopefully you can and apply them in your life. May the Lord bless you and keep you and help you as he makes his face shine upon you. And he will give you shalom, his peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for thanks thinking, for thanksgiving. It's our time to be joyful, to choose joy no matter what, to learn contentment in all circumstances. It's our time to say no to worry, yes to prayer, turn every worry to a prayer. Lord, if we start to worry, may we include you in on it. Take the top off of our of our spirit and just say, God, you know this situation. We turn it over to you. May we be thankful in all circumstances and then learn to think about the right things, feeding ourselves on your word, your creation, the beautiful things, the good relationships that we have, the lovely people that you've placed in our path, all the good and honest and true things. May we think that way so that we can continue to walk this path of faith. And we thank you. Be with each one that's here today and may they experience your perfect peace as they apply this in their lives. Maybe you're watching online right now or maybe you're here and you've never trusted the God of peace as your Savior, Jesus Christ, came and died on the cross for you and chose to take your sins in his own body on the cross and pay for them so that you could be free of your sins. He died and rose again from the dead so you could have freedom from sin, forgiveness of all sin, heaven when you die, the promise of God's presence in your life as you live. And if you've never received Christ, I want to give you that opportunity today as well. It could be a religious person, maybe you're religious, but you've never invited Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior. And that's what this is about. It's an act of faith to trust in Him. And if you want to do that today and you've not done that, or you're not sure you've done it, pray this prayer with me, something like this. Dear Jesus, I invite you right now to come into my life to make me your child. I've been living life the best I could my way but I'm ready to turn my whole life now over to you. Thank you for dying. Thank you for coming back to life again the third day to conquer death, hell, and the grave. I receive your gift of eternal life right now. I'm receiving it as a gift from you. Thank you for giving it to me. Now help me walk and follow you from this day forward as I learn thanks thinking and learn how to follow you. And maybe you're a believer that's here today and you say, I'm making a new commitment to turn every worry into a prayer. And you want to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, as a believer, I'm sorry that I've doubted you so much. I've allowed negativity and doubt and worry to cloud my faith. I'm making a new commitment today as a Christian to put prayer as my first priority and trust you with all my worries. Thank you for being with me today and giving me that strength. In Jesus' name. Before we look around, is there anyone here that says, I just prayed a prayer to receive Jesus and I've never done that or I'm not sure I've, I've done it before? But I just invited Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior today. And you'd like to raise your hand and just say, Pastor Mark, I just trusted Christ for eternal life and forgiveness of my sins today. Anyone in the house? If you're listening online and you did it, let us know somehow. Just write us a note. Say, I just turned my life over to Jesus and accepted his gift of eternal life. 
Are there any believers here while our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, that said, you know, I made a commitment today, a new commitment, to not worry, but to turn my life to a life of prayer. Raise your hand if you made that commitment. Several did. We all need it. Praise God. Lord, thanks again. We look forward to a wonderful Thanksgiving and all your blessings. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.